Hey, we're in uh, the gospel, uh, responding to the gospel is the title of our message in Acts chapter 13. If you have a Bible, please open to Acts chapter 13. Our message comes from verses 38 through 52, as I said, responding to the gospel. And we are in the middle of a passage where we have Paul the Apostle's first recorded sermon as him and Barnabas are traveling and preaching. They have, uh, the, we pick up the sermon right at the tail end, the two key components that are just life-changing for those who hear the message. And everybody responds to the gospel. There are those who respond angrily when they're told about uh, Jesus and what he's done for them and their need for a Savior. There are others who are just kind of casually indifferent. It's kind of like a yawn, like, oh, whatever. They don't really care. But somewhere in that spectrum, all humans find themselves because everybody does respond to the gospel, even if it's a response of neglect or disinterest or a hostile aggression. And so as we see this, we want to go through this passage and see some pretty dramatic responses. Those who will believe, those who will come to hear, those who will reject, and then the response of the preachers themselves to those who reject the message. And so as we look at this message responding to the gospel, to pick up where we left off last week, because you won't really understand the, the power of human response to these two truths, especially if you weren't with us last weekend. If you want to get that message, you can get it at the duplication counter after the service. But in verse 38 and 39, as Paul was bringing his, his short history lesson to a conclusion, taking him right to the person of Christ and the forgiveness that is available in him, he says in verse 38, Therefore... Let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul the Apostle, in bringing his sermon to a conclusion after talking about the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, says, through this man, the Lord Jesus, we preach to you that you can have your sins forgiven and that you can be justified just as if I'd never sinned before. It's a declaration of innocence and righteousness that we know in and of ourselves we do not have. It was that message that so excited these people that were hearing the message for the first time. Sometimes the message of the gospel, for those who have heard it a lot, it has lost its luster. I hope it's not so for you. Because there's really a, a freshness and a fresh power in our lives as we hear it on a regular, consistent basis. Now the response, the first one for those who heard in verse 42 to the message that they could be forgiven and justified through faith, it says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They were so excited about this message, their, hung, their hearts were so hungry from the place of darkness and sin and guilt and shame that sin keeps you, that the thought of somebody sharing with them this incredible news of forgiveness and that they could be justified simply by faith, something that the law of Moses could not do, they begged that that message might come back the next church service, the next Saturday on Sabbath in the Jewish synagogue. I shared with you guys last week that I've been preaching for 23 years and nobody's ever begged me to come back in my whole life. Well, uh, Tim Starnes fixed that for me that last week. He came up and begged me to come back, so here I am. But he wanted to make sure that, that I could no longer say that, all right? But the thing is, is that, that there's such an excitement about this message that there's, they're begging for more, begging for more information about how their soul can be washed and cleansed and in right standing with the God of the universe, now, those were people that heard the message and were excited about the message, but there's another group of people that actually, on the first hearing of Jesus and what he had done for them, they believed. They put their faith in it. They heard it once. They believed it once. That's it. Once God said it, that finishes it. It tells us in verse 43, Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. How do we know they believed? Well, first of all, they had never heard this message before. And then after talking with Paul and Barnabas after the service, when the service broke up, they were encouraged to continue in God's grace, which means they had taken care of the issue of receiving Christ, believing in him by faith in what he had done. A lot of ministry happens after a service. 
whether it's in the prayer uh, corner over there or when I'm talking one-on-one to people or you turn to a friend and, hey, have you ever received Christ? After the service, a lot of ministry happens. Sometimes after service, I'll see, you know, people paired off and they're praying about issues in the room because somebody's really struck with the truth of God's word or maybe they're just in a heartbreaking place in life and, and somebody's ministering to them because they see the tears. Oftentimes when people are leaving and, and they, they're greeting me as they're going out, their tears uh, you know, coming down their face or, or a brokenness has happened inside. Oftentimes you don't even know what God is doing in people's lives. And yet a lot of ministry happens after the service. I pray with people that they receive Christ after the service when they come up and want clarification on things. And so that's what happens here. And this is what Paul and Barnabas encourages them to do, to continue in grace. You would think that if a person begins in grace, it would only be natural to continue in grace. But do you know that's not the human tendency? We sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And yet... What happens in our humanness, we, we usually don't even articulate it, but God rescues us in our sin totally by grace, unmerited favor. God just breaks into your world and reveals himself to you, and you experience a forgiveness and a right standing with God that you did not earn, you didn't work for it, you don't deserve it. But something very subtly happens in the human psyche. Maybe you're a year in, maybe you're six months in, maybe you're 10 years in, and, and it's almost like, yes, I started in grace, but now, you know, there's, I, I've got to do this. And, and now my standing with God really is, is now that I know some information. Now my standing really with God is based on my performance. How much I'm reading, how much I'm praying, how, how much I'm doing of good things. No, you start in grace. God wants you to continue in grace. That means I've been walking with the Lord 28 years. This morning when I woke up, my standing with God is not based on my works, my merit, or how good last week was. Now, God wants us to grow in faith. He wants us to grow in obedience. He wants us to grow in uh, sanctification. He wants us to be transformed into the image of his son. He does all that through the ministry of grace. But today, I didn't get up here and feel like, all right, you guys, I have a right to preach here today because based on my performance for the last seven days, I haven't barked at my wife, kicked the dog, or slapped the kids. You know, I, I, haven't, I haven't made a mess of things so that I, I now, I, I'm in right standing. You know, I want you to know that the day God saved me in grace, and every day up until this point, my only standing, my only basis of interaction with the holy God of the universe is his unmerited favor for me. It's grace. It's grace. Once again, we grow through grace. We grow in the knowledge of grace. We grow in obedience. We grow in giving. We grow in serving. We grow in praying. We grow in studying the word of God. We grow in all those things. Those are all growing. But you grow from the place of grace. But what you don't want to do is now my standing with God is based on how well I've prayed last week, how much I read last week, how many good things I have done, how much I gave. That is all just the fruit of grace that flows out of my life. It's not the standing or the basis or the merit by which I approach God. When I approach God, man, I'm a bankrupt sinner. I'm just one beggar that has discovered where the bread is, and I get to share with you guys where the bread is. That it's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. When I was a young preacher, I used to uh, base the success of Sunday morning basically on my merit of how good I was that week before, if I did really well. And so, what a frustrating thing for a preacher to somehow exchange in your mind the basis and the work of grace, unmerited favor, for now I'm going to come based on my efforts this week, how well I do. And I discovered, you know, almost as if the Lord was teaching me, oftentimes when I had a lousy week, he blessed the most, as if the Lord said, hey, man, this... This didn't start based on you. It's still not based on you. It's all my favor. It's my grace. I love you. you I mean, you can't even, you're breathing my air, man. You, you, can't, you can't roll out of bed unless I, hey, isn't it funny that the most vital things in your life God has taken out of your control? Your heartbeat, you have no control over that. You're breathing. It's involuntary. God, you know, you, you just, the Lord takes care of the important stuff. He lets you do things like put on your shoes. That's what you get to do. You get to put on your shoes. Okay? So 
Paul and Barnabas, when these people believed, what was their number one, according to this exhortation right here, what was their number one exhortation? Hey, you guys just started in grace. You don't deserve God's goodness, but he is good and he's gonna bless your socks off. So I want you just to continue in this grace. By the way, this is the group of people, ultimately this group of people are those who received the letter of Galatians. And what was the people in Galatia, their sin? They fell from grace. They started going back to a works-oriented relationship with God. And the whole book of Galatians is about how foolish that is. Is your merit, your standing, your closeness to God, is it based on your performance this week? Or do you come like me just, man, I just need God's grace. I don't deserve a thing, never have, never, you know. Yeah, I grow in all the other disciplines of the Christian life. I do. But this is where I start, this is where I continue, and this is where I finish in the grace of God. Now, when grace and, and is shared like that, the impact is, is sometimes overwhelming, not only in a person's life, a family's life, a, a church's life, a community's life. Check it out in verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. What can bring a whole city together to hear the word of God? The grace of God. That Jesus loves you and died on the cross, was buried, rose from the dead. Through faith in him, you can have everlasting life. You can be justified just as if you've never sinned before. It's the most amazing message ever. And let me tell you, when people in church can hear about the grace of God and the relationship with Jesus, you can't help but leave this place and radiate with joy and being filled with the Holy Spirit. So you're just telling everybody, man, I just found out I can be forgiven. I just found out. And pretty soon, one person that came to church now turns into a whole row. The whole city. Can you imagine if this Sunday we preach this message and next Sunday, I mean, there's not a place in the parking lot. There's not a place. It's standing room only in this room. There's overflow down the hallways and, and people are just jam-packed everywhere because they are so hungry and excited from the place of their darkness and selfishness and bondage of sin that somebody is throwing them a lifeline that through God's grace and forgiveness you can get out of your misery and the turmoil of your own heart and your own head and your own relationships? That God would break in like that? Man, let me tell you, if we left here as excited as we see these people, we couldn't do enough services at our fellowship to fit all the people. What's that tell us? Well, sometimes we don't have as firm a grip on grace as we might declare we do. Because otherwise, we'd be telling everybody about it. Incredible grace of God. The whole city, almost the whole city, came to hear the word of God. In verse 45, then you're going to get the opposition because you see there's opposition to grace and love. That, that's crazy to me. A Christian is to love God and love his neighbor. He's to love his enemy. He's to love. There's no, if a godly, mature Christian is the most contributing individual to a family, to a work environment, to a society. And what's the great charge? Oh, that person they just, they just love. That's the insult. They're a loving person. We, we hate those loving people, don't we? Get them out of Dodge. Get them out of here. No, it's that the person that's behind that love is Jesus. And people have a problem with Jesus because they're convicted of their sins and they don't want to turn from their sins. As it says in John chapter 3, that men love darkness rather than light, so they don't want to come to the light so that their deeds are exposed. So people are hiding in their sins. And so in verse 45, we see the opposition Paul, when he came, he would preach, great revival. Weeks later came the riot. He's got the revival and the riot ministry, R&R, &R, and it doesn't mean rest and relaxation. Revival and riot, for it says in verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. The religious leaders, the Jews in the synagogue, you would think that a, quote, religious person would be so excited 
that almost the whole city come to hear about the forgiveness of Jesus, that sins could be forgiven, and you could go to heaven. You would think that anybody that is spiritual at all would rejoice in that revival. But every single community, it's a strange thing, every single community has a, um, a religious group of sourpusses in it. Every community. And the religious group, they have these neat, tidy little boxes of rules and regulations. And if something doesn't come in the way that they expect it to come, rather than rejoicing that people's lives are changing and going from sin to a life of walking in the Spirit, they want to reject it. There are four words that are really strong. First, they became envious. That meant that they were really upset that that kind of crowd didn't come to hear their religious garbage every weekend. Religion's really not very attractive to the person that's just lost in their sins because it's a list of their do's and a list of their don'ts and how you dress and how you don't dress and how you look and how you have your hair cut. And, well, you got to cut your hair right. You got to dress right. You got to follow this list and, and you've got to present your way, you know, this way. And you, you've got to have this white shirt because white shirt, that, that represents purity. You got to have the white shirt. Don't, you know, pray tell, don't wear anything but a white shirt kind of attitude about things. So they oppose. They first envy because they're bummed out that that many people don't come to their normal services. Then they, uh, they contradict. So as Paul and Barnabas are trying to preach, they begin to attack. They become hecklers in the crowd to contradict what he's saying. And then they begin blaspheming, speaking very in a derogatory way. And then they oppose the things that are spoken by Paul. Now, Paul could cower at this moment, realize it's a church service. It's a pretty uh, close-knit um, type of dynamic. But Paul grows bold, and I love what he says. Paul gets really bold in verse 46, and he says, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. He says, You know, I've just shared last Sabbath and this Sabbath the incredible good news about Jesus. And you have rejected it and counted yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Wow. Kind of like Stephen when he preached in chapter 7, verse 51, and he says, you always resist the Holy Spirit, even as your fathers did. They were resisting the tug and the pull and the work of the Spirit of God. And he says, you personally have judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Do you know if you're sitting here today and you haven't received Christ as your Savior, you have basically unconsciously or consciously made a decision that you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. God loves you. It tells us in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, also in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that God desires that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God's will, God's will is that you be saved, that you be forgiven. That's why he sent his son, so you would have a way. But when the human heart, when human responsibility, there's two aspects of this in this passage of scripture about responses. There's human responsibility and there's so the sovereignty of God. Those two go hand in hand all the way through the Bible. And so here on their part, Paul the apostle firmly lays at their doorstep, you have had to made a, you've made a decision. You've made a decision to reject the word of God. You've made a decision to reject Christ as your savior. You've made a decision to reject eternal life. It's all on you, man. You see, this is a cool thing. God's method by which he communicates is preaching. Now, the Bible says in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 1 that through the foolishness of preaching, it doesn't say through foolish preaching. It's through the foolishness of preaching, meaning this method of declaring the truth of the gospel. That's how people are saved or reject salvation. You hear the message. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You hear the word of God and you either believe it or you reject it. But when you've heard it, those who are, are, are really held accountable to a higher standard, the more information you know, the more accountable you are before God. Now, Paul says here, or I should say Luke says here, that when the Gentiles heard this in verse 48, 
they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So on one hand, there are those who counted themselves unworthy, judged themselves unworthy of eternal, everlasting life. And on this hand, as many as had been appointed to eternal life were saved. Appointed? Yeah. The Bible says that when you believe, from God's perspective, from your from your perspective, it happens, say, here in 2012. If you were to believe in the Lord here in June 24, 2012, you say, wow, I just, I just received Christ. But from God's perspective, because he dwells outside of time and he has this thing called foreknowledge, God can see the future in his supernatural realm. And he declares in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that the Father chose you before the foundations of the world, that you should walk with him and be blameless. Now, that's kind of mind-blowing. Isn't it? Just think about that for a moment. Before the earth was created, God knew that in February 1984, I would believe. For me, that was new news. Oh, I just got saved. 1984. The Lord goes, now yeah, I saw you before the foundations of the world. I'm really glad he chose me back then because I don't think he'd have chosen me now. But the truth is, is that people really wrestle with this, human responsibility versus the sovereignty of God. In this passage, the two are side by side. Here, as many as had been appointed to eternal life, God chose them. It tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that those whom he foreknew, he did predestine to be conformed into the image of his own dear son. So God has this thing called foreknowledge. He knows how you're going to respond to the gospel, but he chooses us and he predestines us. So from God's side... You're chosen, you're predestined, you're elected for salvation. Now, I just shared with you two passages earlier, both in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 2 Peter 3, 9, that it's God's will that everybody be saved. That's God's will. But then the human responsibility part is when you hear the gospel, that you would respond. That you would respond and believe, not respond and reject. So these two things come together, the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. And when that happens, it's this glorious thing called salvation. Somebody has likened it to this picture. You have this big gate, a big arch. And on that gate, it says, whosoever will believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So you see that, you go, well, I'm a whomsoever. And so you go through that gate and you just think, wow, here's this invitation. I'm going to believe in Jesus. But when you go through that gate and now from the backside, you turn around and you look at the gate from the backside, it says chosen in him before the foundations of the world. You see, that's kind of a family secret. You don't know that secret until you get into the family, right? I didn't know I was chosen before the foundations of the world until the day, you know, I finally read it in the Bible. I go, oh, wow, God says he chose me a long time ago. That's pretty cool. But as far as I was concerned, I received him in February 1984. I'm going to share just a moment with you because I get a lot of people that want to launch into one of two aspects of this. Those who, there are two doctrines in the church. You are young believers. If you haven't got tangled up in this, you will, I promise you. There are those who want to emphasize, they want to emphasize only the sovereignty of God through the doctrine of Calvinism. John Calvin was a guy that his followers assembled his writings and came up with five points of Calvinism about the sovereignty of God. And then there's uh, Arminius wrote a dissertation which was basically a response that there's human responsibility. So the two theological camps, one emphasizing the sovereignty of God, one emphasizing human responsibility, are called Calvinism and Arminianism. Okay? Some of you are going to sleep. It's okay. I'll wake you up in a few minutes. Okay? So I want to share something with you, though. When you exclusively only want to emphasize the sovereignty of God, you rob man of responsibility. When you take the other position of human responsibility, you rob God of sovereignty. I'm not into robbing anybody of anything. God is sovereign. The Bible clearly teaches it. Is man responsible? He most certainly is. And people say, Pastor, are you a Calvinist or are you an Armenian? No, I'm a Christian. And if you wanted to really label me, you would call me a Calmenian. Okay? Because I am both convinced of the sovereignty of God and I am convinced of human responsibility. And to me, it's like a perfect tension. If you remove the tension on either one of those sides, you have an imbalanced perspective. We just read here that the people judge themselves 
that they were unworthy of everlasting life. And then we just saw that as many as had been appointed by the Lord to eternal life believed. Man, it's this incredible thing. It's a sweet thing when you're just a Christian, not hung up in these systems, how you can just teach the Bible. And there are times when I emphasize the sovereignty of God, and then the next passage that emphasizes human responsibility, I'm really free because I'm not trapped by either one of those man-made systems and doctrines. I just teach the Bible. That's what it says. And so, um, and our church usually is made up about 50% of people that are a background, well, I should say 25% of a people background from either one of those sides. And so, uh, usually people are trying to figure out which side I'm on. I'm neither. Once again, I'm kind of Calmenian. So, but the cool thing is, is that when somebody's saved, you realize God did it. God totally did it. Only the Lord can say, only the Lord can draw, only the Lord can do that. All, all a human heart can do is, is respond. We love him because he first loved us and gave himself for us. Well, that's what's going on in this. There's those who have believed and continuing in grace. There are those who showed up on that weekend, but not of all of them believed. There are religious leaders who envied and contradicted and blasphemed and opposed. There are those who have believed and just come into a new salvation experience. And then the result of all of that, verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. Man, when people get excited about the word of the Lord, it just, it just spreads through a region. How, what's that look like to spread through a region? Sometimes it takes five years. Sometimes it takes 10, 15, 20. I know back in 1991... 21 years ago, when I started Calvary Chapel Pocatello, there was no Calvaries in Idaho east of Twin Falls. There basically, at that point, was a Calvary Chapel in Boise and a Calvary Chapel in Twin Falls. And as I went out as a sister pastor and started Calvary Chapel of Pocatello, and then back, coming back here in 93, starting Calvary Chapel of Idaho Falls. Uh, but now we host a monthly pastors, a Calvary Chapel pastors meeting here at our church. And there's Calvary Chapel of, of Pocatello, Aberdeen, Blackfoot, Idaho Falls, Rexburg, Driggs, now even Star Valley, Chalice, Salmon, and we all come together and we pray for one another and share our hearts what's going on in the church and the word of the Lord. And that's not to mention all the other styles of ministry, all the other denominations and non-denominational churches, but that's how it spreads. It takes time for the word of God to take root, but when people get excited about God's word, they want to share it with others, it just spreads like wildfire. Fire. But now the persecution escalates. You see, because they're not content with this escalation. They see how God's word's spreading, and they're trying to stamp it out. It says in verse 50, But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women, and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. The Jews stirred up now the devout and prominent men and women, chief men of the city, it says. This would be the city council. This would be the mayor. This would be the commissioners of the county, if you will. This is the prominent people that the Jews got their ear and said, you know what, these guys are a bunch of troublemakers, and this is what they're, they're causing, this and that, and, and, and all of these different things. And they, they lie to them, and they spread falsehoods about them because here's this, this growing movement, and the community turns, yet there's lots who believe, but there's also a clear opposition. They not only persecute, but then they expel them. They come to Barnabas and Paul, and they say, you get out of Dodge. You got till sundown, get out of town, get out of our district, get out of our county, get out of here. We, we don't want you here with your Jesus and your love and your kindness and your grace and all that stuff. Just get out. Now, Paul here doesn't leave whimpering like a dog with his tail between his legs. Paul is bold and he shakes him and Barnabas, take their sandals off and shake the dust off their feet and take off. Exactly what Jesus told us to do when people reject our message is shake the dust off our feet and go to the next town or the next person or the next per the situation where there might be an open door. And this is an important principle. You know, when you're working with someone, or you're sharing with a family member, and you share the gospel. You share what Jesus has done for them, and he died for them, and you kind of get the whole gospel out there. You might do it through sharing your own testimony. You might do it through giving them a track. You might, however you do it, when you share with someone, and then they're hungry for more, you continue to share more with them. But when they shut you down and tell you to shut up, don't continue badgering them. 
I'll meet people in our church. I say, hey, pastor, I just have some, I want to ask for some advice. I've been working with this guy for nine months, and I, I'm in the first week. i got to share the gospel, and we had an open dialogue for about two weeks, and then he just got hard as could be, wanted me to shut up and stop talking to him about Jesus. And I said, well, so did you? Oh, no, I've been giving it to him every day for the last nine months. I said, well, why would you do that? Well, the Lord said, go into all the world and preach the God. Well, you shared the gospel with him. He got hard. He told you to shut your mouth. So just shut your mouth. Now back up and pray for him. Pray that God would bring his world to a place that he sees his need for you. Pray. Pull back. Jesus said it this way. Don't cast your pearls before swine. You know, you know pigs have no affection or attraction or value for pearls at all. Did you know that? Just... Just throwing it out, out there. It might be a new truth for you. Pigs care nothing about pearls, right? You've never seen a pig with a pearl necklace. He followed that by saying, don't give that which is holy to dogs. You know what? I know you might be a real dog lover, but your dog is not holy. He's not. He's not, right, he's not at home right now having devotions in the Word of God. He's not thinking, oh, no, I missed out at 11 o'clock, 1130 service. He's not, he's not thinking about getting together with the other, uh, you know, dogs and howling the tune for the praise of God. I mean, your dog is not holy. He's a dog. And you think about dogs. I mean, if you think about their real life, I mean, they're a little bit gross. That's what they, what they do. Okay? We'll just leave it at that. Okay? So he says, don't give what is holy to dogs. What's Jesus saying? When you share the gospel, when you preach with someone, when Paul the Apostle and them came into Antioch, Pisidia, they ministered as long as the door was open. And when they said, you know what, you guys just get out of town. They said, okay. They shook the dust off their feet as a testimony against those city leaders. And they just went down the road to Iconium to a new open door and preached the gospel there. So what do you do? I share with people and once I've shared the gospel, I'm usually looking for opportunities. And, and some people will shut you down. You can't even get the gospel out. But once I've shared the gospel with someone, or they, they've declared to me, hey, you know what? I've heard you're a Christian. Don't be telling me any of your Jesus garbage. I say, okay. I just back up and I pray for them. I don't badger them. I don't try to convince them. I don't take the 15-pound family Bible and beat them in the head with it at, at, at work. I just back up. You know what? Because out of the, their own mouth, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and they don't want to hear it. And they may want to hear it down the road, a month, six months, maybe their life gets broken in a year or two or whatever it is, and, and there's a newfound, uh, you know, I, I've had this happen where somebody kind of shut me down hard, especially when I used to work in construction. I'd begin to share with someone, and they'd just basically shut me down hard, and I would just shut up, back up, begin to pray for them. God would work in their heart. You know, and I've had them four weeks later say, hey, you know what, you were, a month ago, you are trying to share that Jesus stuff with me, but now you're not saying anything about us. I basically have a little dialogue like this. Well, you know, uh, I shared with you what Jesus had done for you. You didn't want anything to do with it, so I guess you want to live in your sin and die in your sin and, and uh, spend eternity separated from God. So that's your choice, man. God bless you. You know, and off I go, going to work. <laughs> because the truth and reality is they are choosing a course. They're choosing a course. And oftentimes, you know, if in the right circumstance, you have to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But oftentimes people really don't have a deep appreciation for the good news unless they know the bad news. That is, you are hopelessly lost forever without Christ as your Savior. And if nobody's ever told you that, somebody needs you to love you enough to tell you that. But when that happens, then you back off. I love, you know what? Life is too short, you guys. If this person has shut you down, back off. Pray God brings them to their knees so that they're open to the gospel, maybe down the road. But go on to the next guy. Go on to the next guy. Go, go to the next open door. God, God's got someone else. He's got someone else for you to share with. And when they open up their heart, then you can really spend a fruitful time in ministering to them. Don't waste your time on those who have slammed the door in your face. Pray for them, but don't waste your time. Now, the result of all of this, the response, what Paul and Barnabas left in the wake behind them, when they left to Iconium, it tells us in verse 52, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. 
Then I tell you where the spirit of God has filled up some believers and there's the overflowing of joy. Yeah, there's persecution going on, but man, I'm forgiven now. The believers that were in that town of Antioch, Pisidia, were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were filled with joy. And there's nothing more contagious than people that have genuine, real, bona fide joy. Because this world don't, doesn't know what that looks like. They don't know what it feels like. They don't know what, how to even experience it. But in this experience, they are filled with the Holy Spirit and joy and that is the kind of life that is contagious to affect other people. You know, the Christian life is kind of like measles. You can't give it to someone else unless you have it personally. Being filled with the Spirit and also having that joy. You know, this summer there's a real sickness going on. I don't know if you know anybody that's been affected by it. A real cold that turns into pneumonia. We, we have a number of people in our church that have a cold that's turned into pneumonia. And uh, when you, you start talking to them and then they start ca coughing and hacking and it's got that same similar deep-rooted, you know, lung type of cough uh, thing. And, and so when you're with them and then they start coughing, you know, all of a sudden I want to pray for them from a distance. <laughs> because they, they got the crud, you know. They got, they got the, the stuff that you're not really excited about getting. But just think about the, the contagiousness. Have you ever been around a person that, oh, it's not a hacking cough. It's a person that lights up and radiates with genuine joy. They've got peace. They're a forgiven soul. The guilt and shame are gone, man. They're right with God. Is there anything more contagious or attractive that would draw you to them than that work that God is doing in their life? I wonder as you and I go out from here this week, I wonder what the world sees in our life. I wonder if, if there's something that is so um, uh, mysterious to this world about the source of the quality of life that you demonstrate, you illuminate through your countenance. For we say, oh, their countenance is downcast or their countenance has fallen. Isn't that true? Somebody goes through a hard time, you're sad. You, I mean, your face is, is like telling a story. But the Bible says that we are, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, says we are living letters known and read by all men. I want you to know this week, all week, people are reading your life. A sentence, a paragraph, depending on how much time that you're with them. And when they hang out with us, would they walk away from that conversation? You know, said there's something different about her. They don't know how to describe it. But you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're filled with joy. Because Jesus has broke into your dark world of sin and selfishness, and all of a sudden, you're a new person. That's what God wants to do in our lives and through our lives to impact this world. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that in Jesus' name, you would meet us in this place, and there would be a real freedom by the ministry of the Holy Spirit right now to, to move. Lord, there are those who are just uh, they're really facing some tough stuff here this morning. Their hands are hanging down. They have feeble knees, Lord. They're just troubled. And Lord, we just pray that you would minister to them right now by your grace, how much you love them. Lord, I pray for those who have kind of exchanged, whether they, they recognized it or not, just a, they've really been approaching you based upon their, their performance this last week. And Lord, just remind them that it started in grace. It needs to continue in grace. We didn't deserve it then. We don't deserve it now, but you are working. And Lord, for those who would believe this morning for the first time in you, Lord Jesus, meet them, touch them, impact their world, fill them with your spirit, fill them with your joy that they might experience the joy of the Lord. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.